Throughout the history of the Star Trek universe, there have been a lot of deadly battles. For example, the Battle of Wolf 359, which we've touched on before, claiming 39 Federation starships and resulting in 11,000 either killed or assimilated into the Borg Collective. The Dominion War, though, saw millions of deaths in a giant conflict of its own. But one of the most brutal engagements during this war was the Siege of AR-558. It was marked as one of the bloodiest battles in the Star Trek universe, a damn fine episode unto itself, and for the record, one half of the character arc that has stood out as my favorite in all of Deep Space Nine. Yes, sir. You heard the captain. Sir, what are your orders? There's only one order, Lieutenant. Behold. Do you want to build your own USS Enterprise-D? Of course you do! Fan Who is partnering with top entertainment, gaming and pop culture brands to give you an awesome experience and deeper access to your favourite characters and creations. Think Star Wars, Marvel and of course Star Trek. We've teamed up with Fan Home and have a unique promo code for you to use. Simply check out the link in our video description below, make it so. So what does building your own USS Enterprise-D involve? Well, for starters, this Enterprise is 70 centimetres in length also coming in a width of 50 centimetres and a height of 15.5 centimetres. It's big. It also lights up. Yes, it lights up. You heard me right. Every month, you receive parts to build up. Like this, which is the bridge module. You also get a full in-depth magazine which features the building instructions and detailed information on the legendary starship. Did you know, when you begin your fan home journey in building the Enterprise-D, you also receive some exclusive gifts. This includes items like a metal mug, which is super cool, and a screw box. Handy if you're not losing your parts while constructing this ship. This all sounds cool, right? Once complete, the source section can also separate. So you need to make it so and get started today. Check out our fan home promo code and link via the video description below. Let's make sure history never forgets the name, Enterprise. With that in mind, welcome to Trek Central, lords, ladies and sovereigns. I'm your host, Lieutenant Commander Adam, and today we are diving into Star Trek Explained to explore the siege of AR-558 itself good and proper, regarded as one of the bloodiest battles of the Dominion War, if not the entire history of the Star Trek universe. As always, if you'd like to see more Star Trek Explained, because we can do more than just ships, then hit that subscribe button. Give us a suggestion for a topic in the video comment section below, or just leave some love for Aaron Eisenberg. Rest in peace, good sir. Dearly missed. So, let's talk a little bit about the setting of AR-558 itself. It was a small, barren, miserable little chunk of a planet located in the Chintaka system, within the Alpha Quadrant. With the outbreak of the Dominion War in 2373, Jemadar forces quickly established a relay station for communications there. Before Starfleet and Federation forces could deal with the relay station, however, which caused many issues for Allied fleets, they had to take the Chintoka system in the first place. Now, the first battle of Chintoka, as you may already know, my learned colleagues, occurred in late 2374. The Federation Alliance launched a massive offensive into Cardassian territory and took on the Dominion's combined forces. While the Federation forces would retake Starbase Deep Space Nine during Operation Return eight months earlier, the Federation and the Klingon Empire were still fighting a defensive war at this point. Core worlds like Vulcan and Earth were coming into range of the benevolent Dominion war machine. Whoops, sorry, I mean malevolent. Uh, I knew I shouldn't have accepted that Vorta's dinner offer. Blech. With the arrival of the Romulan Star Empire, a timely arrangement, I'm sure you'll agree, they now had the power to go on the offensive for a change. Admiral William Ross, General Martok, and Senator Letant... Letant? Letant? You know what? Letant. That'll do. Ross, Martok, and the Tent immediately ordered starships to be assembled at Deep Space Nine to prepare for a massive offensive attack on Chintoka. And the operation was launched just in time, as Dominion forces had begun to deploy weapon platforms to protect the system. Led by the one and only Captain Benjamin Sisko aboard the USS Defiant, Starfleet, the Klingons, and the Romulans charged into Chintoka and made light work of the small Jemadar starship contingent that was left behind to defend the location. 
Sadly for the attacking fleet, however, the Cardassians got the energy weapons online just on time, which caused massive damage to the Allied fleet. Captain Sisko pushed on because of course he did, and thanks to the presence of one Elam Garrick, they detected a small moon powering the entire weapons array. While the moon was heavily shielded, Chief Miles O'Brien had the genius idea of imprinting a Federation warp signature onto the shield generator. This turned out to be super effective as the Cardassians' own weapons began firing on their own power source. The asteroid was destroyed, and thus the Allied fleet quickly defeated the remaining weapons arrays and the Jemadar's forces, leading to the capture of the Chintoka system, marking a significant win for the Federation Alliance forces in the Dominion War. Huzzah, Romulan Ale all round. Remember the 34th rule of acquisition. War is good for business. Only from a distance. The closer you are to the front lines, the less profitable it gets. So now we have the wider context, what about AR-558 itself? Well, fine, let's talk about the Federation's bloodiest battle in a bit more gruesome detail, shall we? The siege of AR-558 followed the Federation Allied fleet taking the Chintoka system. The goal of taking this particularly petite planetoid was that it housed a Dominion subspace communication array, sometimes called the Relay Station. The idea of taking that was to tap into Dominion communications and garner a massive intelligence foothold on fleet movements. A small Federation ground troop deployment was sent down to the planetoid under the command of Captain Loomis and Commander Parker. Upon landing, the Federation forces pushed the Jemadar troops out of the relay station. However, doing so allowed the Dominion troops to plant cloaked mines throughout the facility. Federation personnel on AR-558 took to naming these mines Houdinis, and for damned good reason. The Federation left 147 soldiers to guard the station, while engineering personnel disabled the communication array's security grid. Reinforcing the planet and the soldiers was an extremely limited affair. The Federation Allied fleet barely kept a grip on Chintoka, and Jemadar attacks on supply lines meant that reinforcements could never really get there in any reliable time. While the Federation forces held on to AR-558, the remaining Jemadar troops entrenched themselves. They placed in excess of two columns on the planet, and would frequently attack the now Federation-held outpost. They were hoping to break their lines. The troops stationed on AR-558 were supposed to be relieved 90 days into the mission. This, of course, never happened. Instead, they were left there for about five months. By the time reinforcements arrived, Captain Loomis and his second-in-command, Commander Parker, were dead. Therefore, the contingent was now in the command of Lieutenant Nadia Larkin. Eventually, Captain Benjamin Sisko of the USS Defiant arrived to deliver supplies. When the captain and his command crew beamed down, there were 104 soldiers already killed in the line of duty. Those who were still alive suffered from combat stress and a large amount of PTSD. Thankfully, Sisko and a small contingent of Defiant personnel decided to stay on AR-558 and reinforce the Federation forces. However, this would only bolster the Federation soldiers' total to a mere 48. The additional expertise of the Defiant crew allowed the Houdini mines to be located, vastly reducing the chances of further casualties, but Ensign Nog, who was played by the late, great Aaron Eisenberg, led a scouting mission to locate the Jemadar campsite. Now, as a Ferengi, Nog had the advantage of sensitive hearing. His valiant effort, no, not that one, in scouting the camp confirmed how many Jemadar the Federation forces faced. Larkins and Rhys decided to accompany Nog on the scouting mission. However, the Ensign was severely injured during its course taking a particularly violent arrow to the knee when the party attempted to avoid a Jemadar patrol. Lieutenant Larkin was also killed in action. Thankfully, Reese manages to carry Nog back to the camp, but sadly it is revealed that the young ensign would lose his leg due to the injuries he sustained. This left Quark, who had been on a mission for the Ferengi Grand Nagus on the planetoid, a little bit knocked. He accuses Captain Sisko of seeing Nog as an expendable cannon fodder. The argument heats up quickly. Sisko's equally furious and fed up with Quark. It's clear to everyone that the stress of AR-558 and the current situation is getting to everyone, regardless of rank. But I bet you wouldn't send Jake out there. Jake is not a Starfleet officer. 
Esri Dax, for her part, had been working with crewman Kellen, who was absolutely not Will Robinson. What are you talking about? While not being an engineering or science officer herself, Esri could use the experiences of her past hosts to understand the technology behind the communication station. Dax modified a tricorder to cut through the jamming signals and therefore scan the whole compound. Working with Kellen, the pair discovered how to recalibrate it to find the Dominion's subspace mines. It's a sometimes overlooked irony in the situation of this entire episode how inhumane the Houdini weapons really, really are. They were thought to be something only the Dominion would consider using. But with Ezri and Kellen's wizardry, well, now they were in Federation hands. And their position was quite desperate. And you know what that means. Many of the crew reasoned that the weapons were much friendlier now that they were under Federation control, and they were successfully reprogrammed to be used against the now approaching Jem Hadar. Captain Sisko and his crew took up positions ready to defend the base, while Dr. Bashir decided it was time for a little music and play the recording of I'll Be Seeing You over the base's sound system. While the reprogrammed mines do cause heavy casualties for the Dominion troops, it does not kill them all. As we know, victory is life. Yelling war cries, the Jemadar troops rush the Federation forces as both sides open fire on each other. It's carnage in this scene. As soldiers go down, they begin jumping over barricades as the phaser fight soon becomes a battle for survival. Both sides resort to bloody melee combat. Even Reese takes out a Jemadar with a knife, but unfortunately Vargas is stabbed square in the back, while Kellen is just shot and killed saving Esri Dax in the process, but during production, causing the atmosphere to break rather hilariously when Ira Stephen Bear yelled, Star Trek just killed Will Robinson. Well done. Well done indeed. Quark, for his part, even got a shot in of his own, as he was guarding Ensign Nog and was forced to kill an enemy soldier with a phaser pistol, in classic 80s action hero screaming all the time you've got the trigger pulled away. Captain Sisko is knocked out and kicked to the ground while fighting with everything, it seems. Believing he is about to die, he drifts out of consciousness until he sees a Jemadar soldier above him looking like he's about to drop an axe on his face. And then he wakes up, finding Reese standing over him. The siege of AR-558 is over, at least for now, and the Federation forces have held the location. Those were our orders, sir. It's a shocking victory as most soldiers around the base are now dead. Thankfully, the USS Defiant and the USS Veracruz arrived to pick up the survivors, and the Veracruz also delivered new, fresh-faced personnel to reinforce the now fully captured communications array. All in all, joking aside, probably one of the best written and best produced sequences in Federation, never mind that, Star Trek history. After returning to Deep Space Nine, Sisko and Kira review the most recent Dominion War casualty list, Whereupon, Sisko reminds her, They're not just names. It's important we remember that. We have to remember. Now, unfortunately, the Federation Alliance could not hold the Chintoka system indefinitely. Around eight months later, the second Battle of Chintoka occurred, which had devastating consequences for the Federation Alliance. Holding the system was troubling in the first place due to the relay station being there, and Jemadar forces would constantly attack the Alliance's position, take out supply lines, and generally do everything it could to take back key points. By this time, the Dominion had allied with the Breen Confederacy, and this alliance proved to be worth it, as within days of making it official, the Breen launched a massive attack on key Federation targets, which included Starfleet headquarters on Earth, which suffered significant damage. That poor bridge. That poor Golden Gate Bridge. Hashtag poor bridge drive. Wait, no, that's not right. Under the Federation, this was, of course, scary as hell. It was the first time open combat had ever occurred on Earth within 200 years. Following those attacks, the Dominion with her new allies set their sights on Chintoka once again. Outflanking the Allied defenses, the Dominion forces broke the lines in two places during their assault, and while the Allied fleet withdrew, the Dominion retook the planets in the system, basically one after the other, eventually including AR-558. Thankfully, Federation forces had been pulled out of the location beforehand, though. 
and Starfleet and the Allies rallied their ships to push a counterattack to engage the Dominion and remove them from the system. General Martok even took command of 312 Allied warships and rallied them to take on the Dominion fleet. But upon the entering the system, the fleet thought they had the upper hand, and quickly making light work of several Breen warships. However, it didn't last very long. The Breen retaliated by firing off a volley from a new energy weapon, which could devastate the Allied fleet. It completely disabled a ship's primary systems. All of them. This, of course, included weapons, defenses, engines, kitchen sinks, and more. Ships like Captain Sisko's USS Defiant... <sighs> Fine, I'll admit it, were crippled immediately. Following the effective use of their energy weapon, the Breen and Dominion forces switched to conventional weapons and targeted the completely defenseless fleet with a bunch of torpedoes. Given that the entire Allied fleet of ships were vulnerable and unable to take evasive action or even fire back, they were destroyed extremely quickly. Allied forces were faced with no choice on what to do and scrambled to escape pods in a bid to flee the carnage. Captain? She's a fine ship. No one will argue with that. But like you say, it's time to go. But rather than destroy fleeing escape pods, the Dominion leaders chose to shapeshift into Sun Tzu's space-dwelling cousins and allow them to escape. They believed the survivors would spread fear through the Alliance with tales of the destruction and the new energy weapon. As the Allied fleet was quickly destroyed, resulting in arguably the worst defeat the Allies suffered, the Dominion forces retook Chintoka, marking the Second Battle's end. Coincidentally, while the Second Battle was a significant win for the Dominion, it also started to fracture its hold on the Alpha and Beta Quadrants. At this point, Damar, leader of the Cardassian people at this time, and also probably the best developed secondary character I've seen on DS9's run, in my opinion, broke away from the Dominion and insisted the Cardassians rebel against them, because they were now being oppressed. Doesn't that sound familiar? I call upon Cardassians everywhere. Resist. Resist today. Resist tomorrow. Resist till the last Dominion soldier has been driven from our soil. The battle might have been a significant loss for the Allied forces, but the timely rebellion of the Cardassians against the Dominion bought them some much-needed breathing room. So with the loss of AR-558 during the Second Battle of Chintoka, many ask if the battle was even worth it in the first place. The Dominion retook the planet following the Second Battle, and it was put under their rule again. Presumably, the relief Starfleet forces that the USS Veracruz beamed down have been evacuated, we hope. We'd imagine that either the relay communication station was destroyed by Starfleet on the way out, or the Dominion recaptured and began to use it again. But ultimately, the battle was worth it. Holding the communications array allowed Starfleet to tap into Dominion communications. But what do you think of the siege of AR-558? Was the loss of the Starfleet forces and Nog's leg worth it? Should the Federation have sent down more reinforcements in the first place? Could the whole affair have been avoided if somebody had just decided to, oh, I don't know, blow it all up? Probably. But then again, I am unhealthily obsessed with shiny kaboom lights. Let us know what you think in the comments below, and if you want to learn more about the Star Trek universe, then go ahead and suggest a topic. I personally am still waiting for somebody to suggest tribbles, because those little fellas really need a bit more love. Until then, if you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media or join the community Discord server. But for now, I've been Lieutenant Commander Adam. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends.